a Hollywood camera crew fly over a live volcano when they experience catastrophic engine failure. Their helicopter crash lands inside the volcano and the three men find themselves hundreds of feet below the crater rim, next to deadly pools of lava and suffocating in toxic gases. I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I need oxygen. They are separated and it's every man for themselves if they are to survive. In their escape attempts, each man must operate at the very limits of human endurance, all the while believing that their companions are dead. The biggest thing I think about is, I can't believe that God put me on Earth to die in the volcano. The Big Island of Hawaii is home to some of the most stunning scenery on Earth. The island with its exquisite beaches, dramatic waterfalls and dense tropical jungles has been formed over millions of years by volcanic activity. And Kilauea remains one of the world's most active volcanoes. Hawaii's natural beauty has long made it a popular filming location and cameraman Mike Benson is here to shoot the Pu'u'u'u event of Kilauea. I love doing aerial photography. It's a real passion of mine. I love to fly. Every time I get in a helicopter, I'm always excited about doing it. Uh, I just I love everything there is about it. Mike's persuaded his assistant, Chris Duddy, to come along for the ride. I was Mike's camera assistant. So my job was to, you know, mount the camera, prepare the camera for filming. Chris and I had worked on three or four pictures. He had never really flown much in a helicopter, and it was kind of my doing to have him fly with us. In his quest to get the perfect shot, Mike's hired Craig Hosking, one of the most experienced pilots in Hollywood. I fly airplanes and helicopters, doing camera work and uh, stunt work in the film business. Michael's helping me line up the shot. I'm helping him with what I see. It's a real synergy that works between me and the cameraman. We had worked four or five pictures together. So we were kind of like a, a little family. I mean, we knew each other. There was one moment we are flying along the coast. The waves are crashing on the black lava flow that goes down to the ocean. And there's one point where a lava tube opens up and there was actually a lava shooting into the ocean and there was this great white plume coming up. And I was just like, this is unbelievable. And I'm getting paid. <laughs> the crew were shooting the end sequence for the big budget Hollywood thriller, Sliver, in which a helicopter seems to descend directly into the Pu'uo'o vent. Legend has it that the vent is home to the most powerful of all the Hawaiian gods, Madame Pei. And local superstition dictates that you pay homage to her by dropping a bottle of gin into the volcano, ensuring that no harm will come to you. Well, Chris had the bottle. I yelled to him, I said, when we get over the volcano, I'll tell you when to throw it in. Chris, you set? Yeah. Now and he did kind of a, a wussy throw. The air coming up out of the cone is pretty uh, turbulent and it caught the bottle and it kind of blew it back out so it didn't actually make it in the cone. The crater is about two and a half miles across. I mean, it's like hitting the Pacific Ocean. I mean, it's huge. He thinks it's funny. I don't really find it that funny. but. <laughs> So my comment was, well, that's okay, she'll get the idea. Even though the offering hasn't been received, Mike, Chris, and Craig go for a take. Okay, Craig, let's uh, line up for the crater. Craig lowers the helicopter as they skim towards the edge of the crater. And rolling. Even a couple hundred feet up in the helicopter, we could feel the heat coming up off of it. It's incredible. As we arrived near the edge of the crater, we would tilt the camera down and zoom to create the look down, the drop down into the crater. And cut. Okay, Craig, take us down and uh, we'll review that. Let's have a look. I 
and noticed that the length of film was real short. It was only like three or four seconds. Nah, it's not quite there. You want to see it again? Yeah, sure. I thought it was a good take, but obviously when you're making a movie, we do a second or third take in case there's any problems with any of the other takes. It's the ego that we all have to make the perfect shot, to put something on film that nobody else has done before. Now, let's go try another one. You feel when you're filming that nothing's going to happen, that you're encased in this piece of metal of a helicopter, and that it's kind of a safe zone. There is always the element of danger, but I've been doing it long enough that we never felt that we were putting ourselves out on a limb or anything. I get more concerned about the traffic in LA than I do about the traffic in the sky. Okay, Craig, for this next uh, pass, I want to try and take it a little lower and a little faster, if that's all right. Roger that. We weren't doing stunt flying. It wasn't uh, any acrobatic aerial work. It was pretty straightforward flying. And rolling. It might have seemed straightforward, but as the chopper passes over the crater rim, it experiences catastrophic engine failure. The first thing you hear and feel is the RPM decreasing. Usually in an engine failure, you have a quick deceleration. This, it was just kind of slowly spooling down. What's happening? There's a sound that beeps. I'll never forget that. The beep, 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 beep. At that point, we're in kind of a whiteout where the, the plume comes up out of the cone. Oh, man, no way. And then the next thing he said was, uh, we're going down. And that's something you don't want to hear a pilot say ever. You get about a second or two of recognition and then you go right into the emergency procedures. What made this one challenging was uh, the choices I had to make about where to land. I really didn't understand totally the emergency procedures that he was conducting. I was just thinking, are we going to die? By a miracle, Mike, Chris, and Craig survived the crash, but their troubles are just beginning. They're surrounded by deadly pools of lava and choking in toxic gases. I wasn't even really sure where we were. I didn't realize we were inside the, the cone, inside the crater. We looked each other over and Chris was fine, I was fine. Craig was the only one that had a laceration over his eye. <coughs> You're bleeding! What? You're bleeding! I'll get the first aid kit. Fortunately, we missed a steam crater by a couple of hundred yards and we missed a lava pool. So of all the places in the volcano, it was probably the safest place. If you can call it the bottom of a volcano a safe place. The crew is on the crater floor in a thick cloud of VOG, a poisonous mix of carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and hydrogen chloride. If they don't get out fast, they'll suffocate. It had this terrible taste. When you had to take a breath, your lungs would burn. We're thinking that we've got to get out of here because we're going to have a difficult time in trying to get any fresh oxygen. We were probably about 50 yards from the existing lava pool, and it was hot on our feet. You hear it bubbling and, and gurgling and spitting. We realize when we're looking up, we're inside this crater. Oh my God, we got to get out of here. I'm going to try the radio. Mayday, mayday, mayday. The 
helicopter's electrical system has been destroyed in the crash. With no radio to call for help, climbing out is their only chance of survival. We kind of explored going to the north, but that was near the live part of the volcano, and the air was really horrible that direction. <laughs> hey! This isn't working. Let's try climbing up. All three of us were in excellent physical condition. We thought that we could scale out the 300 feet and make it to the top to get back to safety. The inside of the crater is like a bowl, so it's less steep at the bottom, and then as it goes to the top, it gets steeper and steeper until it's basically a 90-degree cliff. The first 100 feet or so were pretty easy. After that, it became deadly treacherous. Ah! And if you've ever picked up a volcanic rock, they're just sharp like needles. And as you pull up on it, it starts to crumble and break away. As we're doing this, you're hot and you're sweaty from expelling all this energy. Chris manages to claw his way ahead of Mike and Craig, but he's now on a near vertical cliff face. There was a few times where I was grabbing, clawing at rocks and I would knock some debris down. I just realized that I'd gotten to a point where it was so sheer and dangerous that I could easily grab onto something that gave way and I would fall. Don't come this way! I'm stuck! It's kind of like when you're a kid and you're climbing a tree and you get up and you can't go down, you can't go up, and so you just kind of hang on. Mike and Craig are 50 feet below Chris. They lose him in the smoke. Chris! Where are you? Craig and I are standing on this little ledge. It's probably about three feet long and maybe 18 inches wide. The air was better, and that's where we could really sit down and digest what had just happened and come up with a plan. Climbing out isn't working. Craig realizes that the only chance of survival lies in getting power back into the radio. He must return to the crash site. I knew how the helicopter electrical system worked. There was no need for all three of us to go back down into the potentially deadly gases. I have to try to go back and try the radio. OK. When he went back down, he really was risking a lot. It's a long shot that Craig can get power back into the radio, but in desperation, he starts to climb down into the dense, poisonous smoke. He disappears completely from Mike and Chris's view. And as Craig inspects the damage, he's overcome by poisonous fumes. He's got to get out. At the bottom of the crater, the peril was horrific because of the air. I found this little cinder hill about 100 feet above the helicopter, and I could go there, and the air was almost breathable. It was still horrible, but the wind would blow just right, and I'd get a breath of air. There were several times where I would fall, and when you're suffering from lack of oxygen, you don't really know it or, or feel it, but, but all of a sudden you're stumbling and obviously you're not thinking clearly. Eventually what I found was a camera battery. The camera that we were using uses a 24 volt battery, which is the same voltage that the helicopter electrical system uses. And I had just a pocket knife, but I was able to cut the end off of the battery cable, spread the wires and strip them down and using the camera battery. I set that inside of the helicopter and then used the normal plugs to wire into the overhead panel to get the electrical system to work the radio. Mayday, mayday, mayday! This is 2 Sierra Hotel! Can anybody hear me? Craig's repeated mayday calls are interrupted by scrambles for fresh air. I'd have three or four breaths at a time. 
where I get no oxygen at all, and it was just gasping. Finally, one of his mayday calls is picked up by a passing tourist helicopter who alerts the emergency services. It was just almost incomprehensible to the guy I got a hold of. He kept saying, you're in the crater, you're alive. We're in need of urgent assistance, I repeat. yells back that he got a May Day out to base camp, and he said, we'll be back in Hilo for dinner. He was coughing and yelling that he couldn't breathe, and he was having a hard time down there. Next thing I hear from Craig is, don't come down here, don't come down here. I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I need oxygen. And then we didn't hear anything from him again. I thought that he died. Craig! Craig! Craig has managed to get back on the radio and establish contact with the pilot of the rescue helicopter. They're on the rock face! <coughs> on the, uh, on the southeast corner! <coughs> no! No, I can't see you! Poor visibility makes it impossible to conduct an air rescue attempt, but the pilot helps coordinate a ground rescue team. The ground rescue team struggle through dangerous terrain, eventually making it to the crater rim, far from Mike and Chris. They can just make out Craig and the crashed helicopter through the VOG. I was able to make verbal as well as visual contact with their lead climber. He felt that he needed to conduct the rescue from where they were, very near the lava flow. We need you to come over here, Craig. We can't go around there. I can't. The air's too bad. And I told him, if I come down to where you are, that it's a one-way trip for me. And it was basically one, two, three, here I come. And I took off towards him. Craig makes a desperate run towards the rescuers, but the dangerous conditions have forced them back from the crater rim. I looked up to the top, and they had disappeared and simply were not there. Under there! By a miracle, I was uh, given the strength to get back to where I could breathe once again. Craig manages to get on the radio to speak to the rescue pilot, Don Shearer. Don, Don, can you read me? At that point, I sounded quite weak. He could tell I was dying. He said, Craig, if I get to you, do you have the strength to get on this helicopter? Yeah, yeah, I get it. And Don said, OK, uh, I'm coming. Now, that was the thing where, um, uh, Don, um, <clears throat> this always happens to me when I talk about Don. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but <clears throat> Don made a life or death decision right then, too. Don, I, Don, I can't breathe. All that Don knew is that I was dying and, um, and he was willing to go for it. Don now lowers his helicopter down into the swirling clouds. He has zero visibility, and there's a real danger of the VOG starving his engine of oxygen and causing it to fail. But Mike and Chris can't hear Craig over the helicopter noise. There was a helicopter that we could hear that was getting closer and closer and closer, but we couldn't tell because we couldn't see it. Chris! Can you see Mike! it? 
The helicopter's drowning out, Mike and I yelling. Don's now flying in visibility of, of maybe five or 10 feet. He can barely see the skid of the helicopter as he's picking his way to try and get to me. Right. I think you gotta come north. I then waited probably at that point in and out of consciousness. able to get on the skid and and I believe with probably the last ounce of energy I had in this earth I was able to pull up and get into the back seat of the helicopter and Don he was now pretty wide-eyed because he had just gone to the brink of his own life because he'd had 10 minutes of the, I would dare say the worst flying that any pilot has ever had in the, in the history of flying Chris and Mike, it seems like the helicopter rescue has been aborted. The helicopter was getting stronger and stronger, then suddenly started to fade and fade until it disappeared, and we, we heard nothing. The temperature inside the volcano begins to plummet. Mike and Chris are now in grave danger of succumbing to hypothermia. It's starting to get a little cooler. It's cold. Our throats were constricted, and it was hard to talk. I thought we were going to suffocate if we had to stay in there overnight. As well as having difficulty breathing, Mike and Chris are also suffering from dehydration. I would take my light meter and I'd turn it upside down and I would gather the moisture that was coming down. <laughs> it tasted uh, like sulfur and it was just uh, a vile, disgusting taste. As darkness sets in, Chris has given up any hope of ever seeing a rescue party. I was soaking wet and I was shivering. I wasn't even sure the rock I was sitting on was stable and what was going to hold me all night. Finally, the rescue team returns. It's a crushing blow. Mike and Chris will have to spend a perilous night in the volcano. The feeling as the sun was going down was that was probably the last sunset I was ever going to see. It was really difficult to breathe. It was really difficult to keep my eyes open for more than a few seconds at a time. So I just kind of made a little tent out of my sweatshirt and just tried to breathe shallow breathing. I'm just thinking to myself, what am I doing here? I'm running on a lot of adrenaline and uh, I couldn't sleep. I'd be sitting there and I'd look down below and I could see the lava having like a light show, different colors of reds and oranges flashing through the mist. It was like a movie set. You know, they're gonna say cut and pull all the sets away and we're sitting here in paradise someplace. I could yell to Chris occasionally and he would hear me and I would hear him. Other times I couldn't hear him at all. hear landslides all around us. Any moment we felt like we could just be in the avalanche or just slide off the side of the cliff. 
I would have put our odds at about maybe 20-30% survival at that point. I was probably going to die. Chris was really despondent. He thought that there was no way that either one of us was going to get out of here. Chris! I was really concerned that he was ready to jump and to just end it all. Chris! 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 Mike and Chris have survived a terrifying night inside the Puuo vent, clinging to the unstable crater wall. They are dehydrated, exhausted, and are suffocating in toxic gases. Their lives depend on the rescue team returning. Mike was the voice of encouragement. He kept saying, don't worry, everything's going to be fine. They're going to come get us. So I, I kind of relied on him for that, that kind of support. Bottom line is, and I possibly caused his death because I was the one that told him, come on, jump in the back of the helicopter and go for a ride with us. We're sitting there and just waiting and waiting and waiting. The rescue team is battling to get to Mike and Chris. But outside the microclimate of the cone, the weather is much more severe. Despite the dangerous weather conditions above, they've made it over to their side of the crater. More to the left! The first one I saw was like about 15 feet away, and I couldn't believe that it was a rope. And then I thought, well, should I try for it, try to dive for it, try to go for it? Thought, no, no, it'll probably get closer. More to the, left! the edge of the volcano is extremely unstable, so the rescuers are forced to stay back. They can't see Mike or Chris, and they can barely hear them. The second rope was probably 10 feet away from us. It was getting closer, but it wasn't close enough that I could actually grab onto it. If I would have jumped for the rope and missed, then it would have been all over for me. <laughs> and I really thought that they were getting closer each time. So I thought, you know, maybe the third time it would be right there that we could grab onto the rope. The third time it came and it was like six feet away. And I decided, okay, maybe I should die for it. The worsening weather above has forced the team to retreat. The attempted ground rescue is over. I had been sitting there for about 28 hours at this point and not doing anything but waiting to be rescued, so I just had to do something. I couldn't sit there anymore. Chris said to me, I have to leave. I have to try to scale out. And uh, I said, come on, Chris, just stay put. We know that there's rescue people that know where we're at. It's just a matter of time. <laughs> I was resigned to the idea that I was going to die anyway. So if I died 
climbing, at least I was doing something. Before I stood up and decided I was going to go, I actually went through and said goodbye to everybody in my family. My sons were like six years old and four. That was really hard for me to sit there and dwell on how would they be without their dad for their whole lives. If I fell off that cliff, you know, there was no chance for survival. I looked at the cliff again, and all of a sudden I see this path. It was the weirdest thing. I'm like, where has that been for the last two days? Mike! I'm gonna go for it! Be careful! maybe 15, 20 minutes into his climb. And I said, uh, how far are you? And he says, I'm about uh, five feet from the top. And I yelled to him, I said, well, when you get to the top, yell back to me. And he said, yeah, I will, I will, I will. About 10 or 15 minutes goes by and I don't hear a, another thing from him. Top, like three feet of the cone it was just a layer of flat gravel and there was no big chunks to grab onto at this point I can't see anything it's zero visibility I'm yelling at the top of my lungs whatever lungs I have left I can't hear anything I have no response now I'm up on this cliff you know just towing rocks and looking straight down. And I thought, oh my God, I made just a horrible mistake. Chris Duddy has almost climbed out of the volcano, but the loose rock above means he can't climb any further. And if he can't hold on, he'll plummet hundreds of feet into molten lava. I don't know what made me think of this, but I just dug both my arms into this gravel to try to get some leverage. And so I dug my arms into this gravel up to my elbows. And it was like sticking your arms into broken glass. I mean, I was just cutting my arms up to get it in there, but I knew I had to get some leverage. So. I got my arms wedged into this gravel, count to three, and I just did a lunge. And I flipped myself onto the top, onto the lip of the crater, and then just rolled over. And I was, I was out. when I got up there that how bad the weather was and you couldn't really hear anything. Mike! Mike! It seemed like my voice just took a turn. As soon as I yelled down, it didn't go down in there. Mike! Mike! 
I started down the side of the mountain and I saw the rope there. I saw a rope. I remember I picked up the rope and I'm gonna go get Mike. I'm gonna go throw the rope down because I know where he is. So I start back up the hill with this rope and then I realized that I'm not strong enough to pull him out right now. I'm in shock, I'm all cut up, I'm in no condition to try to pull Mike out. I'd probably kill both of us trying to do that. So I just laid the rope down, kind of pointing in a, in a line to where he is on the top. Then I started to run down the side of the crater. I'm standing on the ledge and all of a sudden from over my head comes this brown and black object wailing down through the smoke and I hear this thud. And I think that Chris has fallen and plummeted to his death. Chris! I don't get any response and now I think that Craig has died, Chris has died, and now I'm left all by myself. You know, the smoke was swirling around, and I was hyperventilating, and my adrenaline's flowing, and I wasn't sure where I was going, and I almost fell back into the crater. I was so disoriented because of the smoke swirling around. The rescuers had left some cones in a trail, so I, I caught onto that. And I came upon their base camp where they had stayed that night. But nobody was there, it was empty. The unpredictable weather has not only stopped the rescue mission, it's forced the team completely off the volcano. I tried to drink water. It, it wouldn't even go down my throat because my throat had, was so swollen. It was almost swollen shut. <laughs> there were oxygen tanks with masks, so I immediately put a mask on, and I just figured I would hike until somebody found me or I'd find the highway or something. It's a five-mile hike over desolate terrain, but Chris has an amazing stroke of luck when he's spotted by a passing helicopter. Hey! Over here! As soon as they grabbed my arms, my whole body went completely limp. Like, I almost fell over. They had to actually carry me from that point to the helicopter my body just shut down. Chris tells the rescuers that Mike is still alive, but the extreme weather conditions mean they can't make another rescue attempt today. Mike Benson is facing a second night in the volcano. by myself, thinking that I'm the last survivor of this horrendous ordeal in this volcano. And I kind of just gave up hope for a while. I just thought that the only peace that I would get would be if I just passed away quietly. The biggest thing I think about is, why is my skinny little butt sitting here? I can't believe that God put me on Earth to die in the volcano. Is my ego that big that I have to go back and say that I have to do take two because I want take two to be perfect? But no, I've got to make it better. And with that endangering myself and my comrades, I started to see Madame Pele and it was in profile. 
It looked like she had long flowing hair. Probably around three o'clock in the morning, I felt like that there was nobody supporting me, nobody around. My life was coming to an end. So I took a rock and etched on the side of another rock, uh, this big, huge rock. In fact, uh, you know, I love you, Stephanie. <coughs> I just felt that the end was coming quickly and that there wasn't any other reason to live. survived a helicopter crash, Mike Benson has spent a second night in a live volcano. Both his colleagues have escaped, but Mike believes they're dead. Two previous grand rescue attempts have failed, so Mike's film company hire another helicopter pilot to attempt another radically different aerial rescue. All of a sudden, I hear this helicopter flying overhead, and I start to see the tail rotor. I'm still looking up, and I start to see the fuselage. And then a head pops out of the left-hand side, and it's the pilot, and he has this old beat-up Vietnam helmet on, and he's waving to me, and I'm waving frantically back to him. Benson, don't do anything stupid. Don't do anything dumb. Uh, I'll be back in about 15 or 20 minutes. I'm gonna go get a piece of equipment and come back and we're gonna get you out of here. About a half hour goes by and I'm thinking, what's going on? And they can't find me or, or are they giving up or what? All of a sudden, I hear the helicopter, but this time I can't see anything. The visibility has gone to zero. Helicopter comes in, and they were just dropping this net down and just poking it around to where they thought I was. The second time I saw it was like 10 or 12 feet. And with that, it got lodged on this big, huge rock, and it got caught up in the net, and they thought it was my weight that was in the basket, so they powered up. I'm thinking to myself, oh, they're never gonna come back. This time it's like about 10 feet, maybe nine feet in front of me out in the middle of space. And with that, I just jumped into the net. They felt my weight on it and they gave full power and took me up. I could see blue sky above me, and I could see some edges of the volcano. And as we were going past, I remember yelling back to Madam Pele, I won, you lost. Believing that he is the sole survivor of the crash in the volcano, Mike Benson is flown to the base camp to be reunited with his wife, Stephanie. It's so hard to describe, to see the people that you love, then out of the group, 
I see Craig come walking in, and then I realized that they hadn't died. I came over to greet him. He was pretty dumbfounded and amazed and happy that I was okay. I just couldn't believe that he survived another night in that pit. I was so glad to be alive that I could literally have run a 5K. I had this much adrenaline being pumped into me. After test screenings of Sliver, Paramount Pictures decide to change the ending of the film. Everybody asks when they see the movie, well, there's nothing about the volcano in it. And I said, I know, we changed it all. Everything I shot was for, for not. Craig Hosking continues to fly helicopters and planes on major feature films and is one of the most in-demand pilots in Hollywood. For a long time, the volcano incident was on my mind a lot. The rescue, the way we did things, and I guess I got to see the core of myself a little bit, too. Chris Duddy has risen up through the ranks of the film industry. He's now a director and producer. I don't worry that much about death since the accident, you know? I think you just got to live your life and things happen. Mike Benson has shot major Hollywood movies. He still loves to fly and now has his own pilot's license. Two other producers have asked if I wanted to go and do some aerial photography over Kilauea. And I said, I don't want to test fate again and be put in a position that uh, uh, I might have to do take two. <laughs> 